Hey everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for July 29th, 2020. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined by the percipient Ned Damon, Principal Data Scientist at DAT, and Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst at DAT. We're also going to be joined by our boss, President and CEO of DAT, Claude Pamelia, later in the show. And given how exhausting the process was for that interview, we're going to mix things up a bit this week. I'm going to turn it over to Ned first for our key points of the week. And then Dean is going to walk us through our market update before we get to the interview. So take it away, Ned. Thank you very much, Ken. I, I got to say, I got to look that one up. I, I've been I've been tracking on your on your your kind words up until this point, but uh, time, time to crack open the old dictionary. Uh, I'm definitely excited to hear what Claude has to say. Uh, and for anybody who is new to this show, each week we go over what is currently happening in the freight market and share weekly uh, both what's happened historically and what we expect to happen, our rate forecast for our van, reefer, and flatbed. You can find a written version of this at DAT.com slash market update. If you have a burning desire to read rather than listen to our melodious voices. Uh, and for this week in a nutshell, for people who are short on time, there's been a lot of changes. So uh, load posts have dropped about 3% for all equipment types. There's signs of capacity loosening. Uh, dry van rates are continuing to move against trend, but there are signs that they might be peaking and maybe heading back down, maybe. Shippers are still seeing lots of uncertainty based on shifting consumer confidence. We were up in June and then down in July. And there's a lot of signs of carrier network imbalance um, as uh, regions throughout the United States continue to be impacted by surging coronavirus cases uh, that are very uh, heterogeneous. With that, I would like to turn things over to Dean Croak to handle the uh, market dynamics. Dean. Thank you, Henry. So this week, we're going to start off with the dry van load to truck ratio. Last week, the ratio dropped about 5% to 4.23. This was on the back of load postings, which dropped about 4% to just over a million dry van loads for the week. Adding to the equation and the drop, uh, there was 6% more dry vans looking for loads last week, so capacity was easing slightly. Uh, onto the refrigerated uh, load to truck ratio, it dropped about 8% to 7.0, so it's sitting right about where it was in 2017. Similar trends to dry van uh, loads dropped by about 8%. Capacity also loosened with 7% more trucks searching for loads last week. Onto the flatbed load to truck ratio, um, after being flat for about the last two to three weeks, load posts dropped last week for the first time. They dropped by about 3%. Capacity loosened also. There were about 3% more trucks searching for load. Um, but overall, there is a trend towards uh, capacity loosening. Uh, the truck ratios dropped about 6% last week, so we think capacity is going to start to loosen there. All right, so switching gears to uh, market condition index for dry van. This week shows tight capacity putting up a pressure on spot rates in some of the larger freight markets around the country, including big markets like Harrisburg and, and Memphis. In those particular markets, volumes are up about 2% week over week. Um, over on the West Coast, uh, Ontario, the large freight market there, volumes are also up 2% week over week. And Ontario is an interesting market. It's, it's kind of a bellwether for the national freight market because it's close proximity to the ports in Los Angeles and Long Beach. It's also an ideal location as an intermodal uh, warehousing and freight hub. So uh, what we observed in May and June, a lot of imports coming in, spot loads are now trickling out of Ontario market from the warehouses. Volumes were up 4% last week. But interestingly, volumes are now increasing for the fourth week in a row. Uh, most of the freight out of those markets are going to warehouse markets like Stockton, Phoenix and Dallas. Dallas took about 8% of the loads last week, Dallas about 6% and Stockton about 6%. Um, On the refrigerated market condition index, this week uh, we're seeing seasonally strong produce markets in Southern California and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you can also see this week North Dakota's Red River Valley coming online with peak produce uh, for sugar beets. It's the third largest producer of sugar beets in the country. Also produces a lot of potatoes, which we're consuming as comfort food during the pandemic. Uh, also a lot of activity on the East Coast import market in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Uh, their reefer volumes were up about 6% last week, but they're up 30% month over month, and it's largely driven by uh, southern hemisphere citrus that's arriving from Chile, Australia, and South Africa. About 15% of the loads out of Elizabeth went to Harrisburg, Atlanta, Boston, Lakeland, and Miami last week. And just this morning, the USDA reported that U.S. truckload shipments of produce were down 6% 
last week for the lower 48 and down a whopping 26% for imports. So year over year, that translates to about 6,200 fewer loads last week compared to the same week last year. Shifting to the flat mark, uh, the flatbed market index, uh, market condition index, we see lots of tight markets this week, especially in the southwest where there's not enough trucks for loads. Uh, the southwest is fascinating because about 50% of all new homes get built in that region. Uh, if I look at the volumes in that particular area, well, the big lumber producing states, volumes are up about 10% week over week and are expected to remain strong, especially on the back of the recent Department of Commerce report, which showed that new home construction is up about 17%. Of course, the southwest uh, and southeast get battered by hurricanes. We've got a hurricane taking aim at Miami this weekend, so flatbeds tend to benefit from hurricanes uh, in the post-hurricane period in the rebuilding effort. We, we saw that in 2017 with some of the big uh, cat fives. So let's switch to spot rates and have a look at some of the year over year uh, comps. In dry van, uh, spot rates averaged last week about $1.88 a mile. This is the exact same level they were in 2018 when we had the worst capacity crunch in a decade. Uh, it's pretty unseasonal for rates to be rising this time of the year. We attribute it to shippers seeking capacity, particularly surge capacity for, for freight on certain lanes. Carriers are still reporting lots of imbalances on a lot of their major origin destination pairs, pairings. As consumers, we're also changing our behaviour. You know, instead of spending money on vacations, movies, concerts and dining out at restaurants, we're eating uh, at home and, and vacationing much closer than we would normally do. And, and we see that playing out in the way freight moves. And as an example, uh, food and beverage loads are paying much higher at $2.14 a mile. That's 26, that's 26 cents per mile higher. Uh, while chemical products that are used in a lot of manufacturing are down around $1.91 a mile. So that's a 23 cents per mile swing between retail and manufactured products. On to refrigerator spot rates, the year over year view shows something fairly interesting, similar trend to dry van though, um, up unseasonally. We're now just seven cents per mile off the highs in 2018. Uh, rates ended last week at about $2.10 a mile, but, but they were up one cent per mile last week. Uh, but signs of the market cooling. Uh, similar to dry van, food and beverage is paying much higher. Beverage loads in the refrigerated space are paying about $2.45 a mile. That's 35 cents a mile higher than the national average. Uh, food slightly lower at $2.33 a mile. That's 23 cents a mile. On uh, the West Coast produce markets, Fresno is paying $2.32 a mile. And as the Mexico produce season cools down, uh, the border markets of Laredo and McAllen are only paying about a dollar. 90 mile for refrigerated load volumes. Um, and lastly, flatbed spot rates year over year. Uh, flatbed rates are up around $1.98 a mile, which is pretty good. They were up three cents a mile on the, the week prior. Again, high demand for new homes in the southwest is driving this. That continues to be the lead story along with home improvements that people are pursuing during the pandemic. Um, if we take a look at southwest region rates alone, they're running at about 220 a mile. So they're about 22 cents a mile higher than the national average. But, but again, at a specific commodity level, there's a variance. Rates for lumber in particular, where there's a, a shortage, rates are higher at 223 a mile. Building materials are slightly higher again at 226 a mile. So Ned, that's this week's freight market update. What are you looking at for rates down the road? So we're gonna start off by looking at the national spot rate uh, forecast for dry van. So you can see the blue line represents the actual market rates observed by DAT. And then off on the right, you can see four different models, uh, our short-term model in red, our rate cast model in green, and then two blended forecasts that are mixtures of the two models in different ways and in different proportions. So um, rate cast has basically given up on uh, enforcing a normal seasonal pattern, which I think is for the best because it looks like we're not gonna be going back to a normal seasonal pattern anytime soon. Uh, I'm a little bit suspicious of the short term continued up and to the right, but given that we've been seeing some signs of peaking uh, in some of the load to truck ratios and in some of the, the MCI data. So I would expect the blended forecasts to be uh, a good guidepost, maybe leaning a little bit more towards the gray going forward. You can also see that there's a lot of model divergence because um, things are really unsettled right now. And so there's not a lot of broad agreement between the, the different models about which way we expect the market to be going. Uh, moving forward to uh, reefer rates, you can see again the blue line as historicals observed by DAT. And then uh, off to the right, the four different models. 
Here, uh, there's a little bit more model agreement. The divergence between the models isn't quite as pronounced. Short term is basically at a higher level, and but the slope has cooled off a fair amount. Rate cast has kind of come around to a flat period going forward. And then the two blended models are slightly up and to the right. Here, I think, again, the, the gray or the, the yellow blended forecasts are probably likely to be a good signpost for, for where we expect rates to be going forward in the near future. Uh, finally, we're looking at flatbeds. Uh, flatbeds are where we have the biggest metal divergence. Again, uh, you can see blue are the actuals, whereas, um, or rather, uh, blue are the historical rates observed by DAT. Uh, and off to the right, you can see the four different models again. Here, uh, Ratecast is expecting there to be a correction. Uh, short term continues to expect that that strong up into the right behavior. And you know, given the track record of flatbed where it's been up into the right since about uh, 28th of April going forward, um, I'm starting to get a little bit suspicious that anything can dent its momentum, but I still feel like um, Ratecast is picking up and the, the blended forecasts are picking up on something. And I do expect things not to quite be going that straight linear pattern. I, I do expect there to be at least a little bit of a correction going forward. All right, uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ken for his interview with Claude Pamelia. I'm really excited to hear what they have to say. Yeah, thanks, Ned. Earlier this week, I was actually able to catch up with Claude, <clears throat> ask him some questions about what, what's going on in the freight market and what he's hearing talking to other CEOs. Um, and without further ado, we're going to run that interview right now. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining us this week, Claude. Thanks, Ken. It's great to be here, and um, I'm thrilled I finally got an invitation to uh, join your show. Yeah, the first couple were lost in the mail, so it's my bad on that. I, I came from FedEx, but um, I've sort of lost that <laughs> that skill. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about this week, but I think front of mind for everyone is COVID-19 and the impact that it's having around the world. So can you talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted DAT? Sure. COVID-19 has had a significant impact on us, like every business across the world. Um, for DAT, I think about early March when we were looking at kind of the spikes in the virus and the beginnings of closures across the U.S. and realized we needed to do something to keep our our teammates, our employees safe. And um, we finally concluded the only way to do that right, like many businesses have now, is to go fully remote. And um, it was a big decision. We have over 500 employees across the world and we needed to kind of very quickly make sure that even those who weren't completely prepared to work fully from home would be able to in a very short period. So first step was our IT team really stepped up and through a heroic effort over the weekend, bought the equipment, get the systems in place that needed to be there for our customer support teams, for our inside sales teams, so that we would just have absolutely a seamless kind of move to the remote environment. And unfortunately that went well. And I think it was the, the collective effort of everybody on the team to really kind of step up and do what it, do what needed to be done um, to make that happen. Then we went into the mode, I think like many businesses of how do we ensure that people who are now no longer in the office have an environment in which they can do their jobs productively how do we ensure that um, teams stay in touch in a way that before they could walk around and speak to one another? Um, so of course, video technology plays a tremendous role in that. Virtual whiteboarding technologies, a whole variety of things were kind of put into place. And um, fortunately, being a technology company, being a software company that we are, right? Um, I think most people took to this very effectively and again, continued to kind of just figure out how they needed to problem solve if something came up. And um, what we did from a management team level is survey our employees by under, you know, using different surveys that are out there to kind of understand how people feel about the situation, what we could do better, much more frequent all hands communication, um, and just a holistic effort across the board to connect with everyone and ensure that uh, we understood what was happening and how we could deal with problems as they came up. And um, for us, fortunately, I'm grateful for the fact that our team has responded in such a way that our customer service, our product innovation, um, our product delivery timelines are all as good as they've ever been. So we, we feel grateful for that. It's been a remarkable crash course in leading remotely. I know that for sure over the past few months. Um, if, if For folks who've been watching our weekly updates over the past few months, you've really seen us talk about how the market is shot up and then down and then back up again. And all of that really takes a toll, good and bad. 
um, on our customers and our partners. And you have the, the fortunate position of being able to talk to a lot of those senior leaders. Um, what have you been hearing about what they're seeing in their business and how they're reacting? Yes, um, I have had a chance to talk to a lot of different folks. Um, we've got some CEO forums, obviously some different different customer forums. And uh, it's been striking to see, I mean, there's some similar themes, right? I mean, A is just the, the general challenge as leaders of companies to help employees and teams through what's an unprecedented situation, right? Um, it's not just the economic news and the challenges that are associated with that. It's also working from home, being quarantined, um, dealing with a whole variety of issues from mental health issues to just uh, general connection and how people connect to one another when they're not in an office environment. What's been, I think, gratifying is that I've watched the business community come together, leadership at different companies, be very willing to kind of trade um, tips and notes and understand kind of how we can do things better. But um, I think the general theme has been one of, you know, communicate frequently, communicate via video. Video is critically important in this. It's not enough to just be on the phone and also just stay in touch with kind of what, what the issues are people are dealing with and be proactive about trying to sort to, to understand them and know what's happening. Yeah, that's, that's great. I was part of one of those CEO forums and I think it was really interesting to hear a lot of the similarities, but then also some of the differences they were facing in their challenge, especially depending on where they are in the country. You know, some are in hot spots, some are in areas where it's not as big of a deal. Yeah, that's um, absolutely true. Yeah, so for those less familiar, DAT has two main areas of focus. We have DAT IQ, which is my area of focus, which is the rating and analytics, but we also have DAT1, um, which is just as much, if not more important. And that's a what we call a platform business. It's where it's a two-sided network. We have brokers and some shippers coming together to match up with carriers and independent owner operators. And I think as we all know, there are issues impacting both of those groups differently. So I'm really interested in your perspective on what have you seen and how that impact has been different. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ken. Um, I think if you think about the, um, the two-sided network, right, that is kind of DAT1 or the freight match platform, carriers and brokers are coming together to kind of interact with one another. And we have seen kind of some different sort of implications for each side of the network. One theme that has kind of remained true throughout, though, and that we're happy about, right, is the, the value that a two-sided network like DATs, which is the largest two-sided network in Freight Match, right, can provide to our customers during these trying times. We start with carriers, and carriers experienced an unprecedented disruption. I mean, not just roller coaster rates, but initially, if you remember, I mean, rates crashed below five-year lows. And as carriers out there trying to do business, it was extraordinarily trying. So they had that economic pressure in terms of could they even make a return on a load combined with just the, the actual risks of dealing with COVID-19, right? They're on the front lines. They're traveling across the country trying to find, you know, open places to eat, um, the right truck stops to stop in, whatever it might be. And um, dealing with the same PPE shortages that many of our frontline workers across the country have dealt with, and doing it, I think, in a heroic fashion, um, we were really struck again and again. And we, I think, at DAT, we have a unique perspective, right? Because we have um, over 1.3 million trucks in our network, and the fact that we can see often what all of these uh, carriers are dealing with in this type of environment was was particularly insightful. We tried to you know, make whatever changes we could quickly to our platform to make it easier to use, to um, provide some level of assistance to them as they kind of grapple through this. But I was pleased to see too, there were a lot of articles in the press at the time, I think in the early stages, kind of April, late March, about the heroic nature of what truck drivers are doing. And people started to appreciate, right? Whether it was through the fact that toilet paper was getting to stores or whatever it might be, that that happens because of what truck drivers do. Um, on the broker side, I think a little different challenge, not dealing with sort of the, the physical outside world in the same way, but dealing with the fact that you have often an office environment that needs to go remote and then having to grapple with the uncertainties caused by this very exceptional roller coaster rate environment. And I think also, if you think further on, right, just how do you get informed about what the economic world is going to look like, not just in you know 12 months, but even in six months? as we see the virus kind of hotspots break out, whatever it might be. 
again, I think we've been really pleased that DAT can play a role in helping grapple with some of that uncertainty. You can use RateView, RateCast, MCI, a whole variety of products that we have out now. You can um, tap into some of the data and analytical services that you offer, Ken, through your team. And um, as you know, we've seen, surprisingly, even in a very challenged economic environment, we've seen significant growth in the purchase of those services because again and again, our customers are telling us how valuable these insights and these analytics, these predictive um, insights that we have are to them and their business. Yeah, you know, Claude, one thing we've seen universally, whether you're a shipper, carrier, or broker, is the influx of requests to make faster decisions. So you may have been changing your pricing or costing methodology on a weekly or bi-monthly basis. And now we're seeing requests for data to support daily decision-making just because of the uncertainty and volatility. Yep. I think that's been a theme. You, you mentioned again, kind of when we had the CEO form and other things, right? The compression in the decision cycle that you need to make as leadership teams has, has really been prevalent across this, right? I've even seen some articles, I think it might've been in the Harvard Business Review, a few other places. But you know, instead of having an annual planning cycle, we're almost forced to have a quarterly planning cycle or even a monthly planning cycle, right? And we're all grappling with that. And part of the, it also contributes to the fact that everybody feels like they're working even more in, in this quarantined environment because we all have to kind of make decisions faster, more rapidly with even more data, so yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, so enough about COVID. Let's pivot out of the general news headlines and, and talk about our industry for a minute. We recently announced that we've um, acquired Freight Market Intelligence Consortium, or FMIC for short, from Chainalytics. As a data nerd, as an industry nerd, I know what makes me excited about that, but what makes you excited about that um, as the leader of a now unified company? Yes, thanks for asking that one because it's something we're all really excited about. I'm particularly excited because I think what it offers for us at DAT, right, is the ability to bring together two tremendous reservoirs of data. Um, the FMIC's contract shipper transaction data, which is about $50 billion worth of data, and our rate view data, which is about $68 billion. You combine those two things, you think about the perspective you get on contract and spot markets, this 360 degree view of the of the marketplace i think it's unrivaled there's nothing like it in the marketplace and we feel i think particularly grateful about the fact that we now can bring together these two really expert teams um, we we have with fmic a real deep bench of an understanding of shipper contract data and shipper models and um, we already have a dat a very deep bench of understanding about rates in the spot market and tremendous data science capability. You bring these two things together and we're gonna be able to offer something in the marketplace that no one can. And again, it's around this notion of helping customers understand how they can take vast amounts of data and turn them into insight about their business, turn them into something that allows them to make a more informed decision in a super uncertain world. Um, and that's exciting because what really gets us going at DAT is whenever we feel like we can add unique value to our customers' businesses and give them something that they can get nowhere else because it makes the whole freight and logistics ecosystem work better. Yeah, you know, we all love data, but one of the things that really has gotten me excited to roll up my sleeves and come to work is we can confidently say at this point, we've built the deepest bench of experience and expertise in the industry. And I think what also is exciting in being a part of this is where other folks and other companies are contracting their side of the house around industry expertise and analytics and downsizing, we're doubling down, right? We're investing in this. We see this as core to our business. So kind of what I wanted to ask you as a follow-up question is how foundational is having that base of both data and expertise to the future of DAT? Yeah, that's a great question because it's it's very foundational. And I, I think I want to take a moment, like the point you made too, that we're investing in this environment it is a testament to kind of our confidence about where this is going. But having both, you know, the data and this really deep level of expertise across people is super important to us. It's something we're going to continue to um, invest in. Um, in fact, if you think about it, when we announced the purchase of FMIC and actually closed the transaction. And we immediately embarked on an investment plan in which we're investing more in FMIC than was previously being invested. And we're doing that across both data science, 
software engineering, marketing, so that we can help people kind of understand what's really available out there. Because we think that um, there's a tremendous number of customers that aren't even aware of what they can do with this data and how they could use it. And again, that's a really exciting thing. When you're a technology company that's combining you know, data science and computer science and wanting to make offerings to your customers, when you get an opportunity to do something like this, it's a, it's a unique one and we wanted to really capitalize on it. So we're all super excited about that. Yeah, for sure. And this next one's an easy one, but it came in through Ask IQ, so I wanted to ask you anyway. Um, can we expect any major changes for FMIC in the short term? No, if you're a current FMIC customer, you can be confident that you're going to continue to get the service that you're used to. You can continue to access the, um, the models and the data that you had before. We're not going to make um, changes to that. What we are going to do is think about how we can offer in the future, in addition to what's already there, additional offerings that are more valuable, more insightful, and give just um, greater perspectives on what's happening in the market and how you can then use that to manage your business. So that's really the theme here. Um, you should have no doubt about the fact that you'll continue to get exactly what you expected and there won't be changes caused by this acquisition to what FMIC is and what it provides to you. Great. So this is one of my favorite questions. I try to ask it to every guest, but Wrapping up, what do you see coming down the pike as far as changes in our industry over the next five to 10 years and beyond? It's a good, it's a good question. I'm glad you ask it each time because I think it's, um, it's, it's a question that's on everyone's mind, right? Because if you think about the evolution of our industry and freight and logistics from 40 years ago, a regulated industry that's now um, in a very different place and people are starting to adopt technology at an accelerated rate, to me, the theme that comes out again and again when you kind of think about future state in five to 10 years is how technology, how tech enablement and digitization really um, changes how customers and how, really how players in the industry deal with one another. And um, they're going to be using, I think there's two key themes around that. One is making things more efficient. Second is making things more effective. Um, so wherever you can, right, you use software to have less manual steps in a process, then wherever you can, you also kind of use informed analytics to make better decisions. And the people that are going to kind of thrive in this world over the next five to 10 years are going to be the ones that leverage both kind of that industry expertise with deep technology expertise and are able to make smarter, faster decisions than the other people around them. And one of the things that gets us excited, as you all know, with the work that you do, Ken, we feel like DAT is in the center of making that a reality for our customers. So those that choose to come use our network, that choose to come use DAT IQ services are going to be basically in an exceptional position to kind of manage through that uncertainty. And, um, you know, as a software company, obviously we're biased toward technology being something that is a big positive in people's lives. But we feel like we're on the cusp of entering an era for freight and logistics that's going to be um, unparalleled in kind of the excitement and change that occurs. And while that can be scary to people, right, as they think about it, if you have the right partners with you kind of to work through that, it can also be an exceptional opportunity to scale your business, to get an advantage position that those who don't want to kind of embark on that tech enablement mission aren't going to participate in. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, you know, we'd love to have you back on for a follow-up discussion because I feel like we can spend a whole other session talking about the future of freight um, and how DAT kind of plays a part in that. But wrapping up, I want to thank you for coming on, Claude. I hope I hope we were on best behavior and, um, you know, the paychecks will still keep coming every other week. But with that all being said, I want to, I want to thank you again for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it back to Ned uh, to wrap up the show this week. Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate being here, Ken. And um, again, you're doing an exceptional job with this. Appreciate all the great shows you've produced so far and looking forward to hopefully being back in the future. I was really, you know, from my point of view, things have been very transparent. Um, like I haven't really seen as much of a different, well, other than the fact that I'm at home rather than at work um, between the pre COVID and the post COVID world. And um, I, I feel like a big part of that has been the fact that you and Claude and other folks have been spending so much effort to try and keep things organized and to keep the company running smoothly. Uh, 
you know, a, a Google Hangouts meeting isn't quite as efficient as having everybody in the same room, but we've definitely been able to, to keep things running. And I think that's to a large part about you guys spending so much effort and so much um, thought on ensuring that we have continuity of operations uh, going forward. Dean, what do you think? Yeah, I think uh, it's it's been a benefit. I've been uh, much more productive. Uh, of course, not traveling makes a big difference, but Zoom meetings have certainly been a big bonus. I feel like I'm communicating more with people at work uh, than I ever used to. Uh, I've, I've benefited a lot from um, just the interaction over Zoom. Technology, I think, has bridged that gap nicely. And I think that's about it for our show this week. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, that you're willing to tune in and, and listen to us uh, natter on about uh, the exciting world of, of freight and logistics. Uh, I want to remind folks that you can find weekly updates in a more text format at dat.com slash market update. You can email questions, comments, et cetera, to askiq at dat.com. Uh, we'll also be offering our top 50 lanes report for free. You can email us at askiq at dat.com to receive that. Currently, I believe it's only van uh, top 50, but I think that we can look to expanding to flatbed and reefer in the not too distant future, given the success of this of that program. Also, as a reminder, if you like this program, please do like, subscribe, do whatever the happy action is on your social media platform of choice uh, so that we can keep doing these shows. Thanks, everybody.